that coming visit with this one. So the topic I've got is called um, the ownership of knowledge or who owns knowledge. And it the, the purpose is to develop an idea which uh, Professor Bodrunov has uh, drawn my attention to and on which I worked closely with uh, with Sasha Buzgalin. Uh, this is the idea of distributed ownership. And I want to argue that distributed ownership is extremely appropriate for the management of uh, what I call mental objects for, for no, the purposes of noonomy. Uh, but it's more generally the objects we're speaking of are generally known uh, in the rest of the world as, as, as knowledge. Uh, I do have one objection to this, which is I think most of what is put around and claims to be knowledge is not knowledge at all, but ignorance or stupidity. Uh, but it's still a mental project. It's still the subject to the laws of ownership. And of course, there are many, many, many uh, creative objects which uh, Professor Buzgalin referred to, such as uh, uh, songs, poems, theorems. Uh, well, not not theorists, but songs, poems, books, and so on, which which cannot just simply be described as knowledge. They're they're mental products in a more general sense. So I'm going to start off sharing my screen, and I hope this works. And off we go. So the case for distributed intellectual property. Now, the origin of this is actually. Something that happened in 1995 when the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO as it's usually known, which was founded in 1970, was converted from a talking shop into a powerful multilateral instrument. And the purpose was to get a world trade in knowledge. That was the declared purpose. Now, the consequences is it actually changed the rules that govern who has rights in relation to knowledge or mental products. To take a simple example, copyright. Copyright originally was intended to protect the author. It, it literally means the right of the owner, or the right of the, sorry, the creator, the right of the creator to benefit from the uh, work of creation. And in French, it's called droit d'auteur, the right of the author. And it's inviolable. When you uh, assigned somebody the right to use your copyright, you still retained the, uh, the, the author's stake in what was done. That was abolished by WIPO. It merged copyright with patent and it created a single universal law to manage what they call knowledge and its creation and its use. The very important principles that were new as well were non-discrimination. And that meant that you couldn't in your own country manage knowledge in such a way as to interfere with the world rights of the property owner. So you could not discriminate against another country in determining how you yourself will manage technology. It's one of the big disputes, uh, causes of the dispute between China and, and, and the United States is the interpretation of that particular clause. Multilateralism meant that you had, it's, it's part of what the US sometimes calls the rules-based order. It means you have a set of rules which are decided by all the members of WIPO, and that then becomes something that everybody must abide by, even if they didn't agree with it. You can't make bilateral single arrangements between one nation and another or between a group of nations. And most important, it takes no accounts of the needs of the people who actually produce creative products, mental products, or who use them. All the rights are concentrated in the hands of the owner. So what this really did is it established corporate ownership. The time span of intellectual property was expanded to 70 years. I think that's one of the clearest signals that it was no longer a human right, but a corporate right. As I said, it merged patent and copyright. It also greatly lengthened the duration. Patent protection used to be 10 to 15 years. And in India, it was actually seven years because the purpose of patent was to just allow the inventor of a new product to bring it to market with a sufficient time gap between when they had finished with it and when they had done this and when others came in, a sufficient time gap that they could reap some uh, recompense for their expenditure. That was the idea. But now it's been turned into a form of rent. It's a permanent right to basically get all, 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 the, all the benefits of an invention uh, until, it's, it's, uh, until the invention has passed its useful life. It's exhausted, if in effect. Um, 
And that gave rise to a practice which has now become very common and is quite negative and is done much in the USA, which is the blocking patents. A blocking patent simply says you take a patent out on a new product, on a new in, uh, process or product. You don't use it. You simply stop other people using it until such time that you feel you can either get some money out of them for, for, for using it or, or simply prevent them competing with you. And this led to intellectual property being weaponized, which I think we, we've particularly seen in the uh, struggle over the control of technology between the United States and China. So I want to put a very simple alternative forward. And um, the term that I give to the existing uh, system, that the WIPO system, is enclose and enslave. Enclose property, put it all in one bundle, give it to an owner, give that owner full rights over what you do. But you also enslave the producers because the producers themselves are now controlled by you. It was a very famous case when George Michael uh, sued Sony Corporation. Uh, for what he called a slave contract, because they forbade him to perform his own music because they owned the copyright in that music. And that practice is, is, is really quite general. So what you've got to do is to think in terms of how you make sure that people can create and get an incentive to do that. How do you make sure people can apply inventions? So to promote the invention and reward the inventors, which means you actually need to recognize their stake in the ownership of the mental product in question, which is why I believe that distributed ownership is central. So you have to reward creators. This is absolutely central, particularly the more creative activity becomes generalized in the economy, it becomes an absolute sine qua non of technological development. Uh, and I hope that Professor Belousov will be paying careful attention to this in his new post. A primary need in science and technology is to raise productivity. That's the purpose of invention. That's not just finding something or discovering something, it's applying it and it needs diffusion and application. And research is not the same as development. Development is not the same as application. So you have to reward everybody along the chain of inventing, applying and bringing to market or bringing into use if it's a public a public facility. The same applies in the creative industries. Uh, sometimes these are thought of as cultural. I, I have a dispute with that because I think, for example, software is actually a creative industry. Um, and many things that are not regarded as, as, as creative, uh, as cultural, or in fact, play a creative role. But that, that's another discussion. Let's just say any creative activity that enhances human experience makes life better. The priority there is the user. The user has to have access to whatever it is that you produce without paying uh, unaffordable amounts of money for what is basically an act of design. So the creators must receive an income that maintains their capacity to create. Otherwise, how can the user get it? They have to develop their skills, they have to build social networks, and they have to find their audience. So that, for me, defines the basic principles of distributed ownership in a pluripolar world, or multipolar world, uh, which Hugo Chavez, as Radhika Desai has emphasized, said is not merely multipolar in the sense there are many countries, but pluripolar in the sense that there are many different social systems in the world. So. The WIPO definition converts IP ownership into a monopoly. It disenfranchises knowledge producers, it disenfranchises knowledge, knowledge users, and it disenfranchises nations, entire nations, stops them getting the technology they need to develop. Distributed ownership would recognize the stake of the producers, would recognize the stake of the creators through uh, a very important uh, system that's actually in use, it's highly disputed, but it's called deferred value creation. If you create something whose value rises as your work becomes recognized, for example, if you're an artist or a, if, if you're a, a Taylor Swift, then um, the, the value that you create uh, actually acquire, uh, accrues to you. 
Now, I don't mean Taylor Swift is not being paid. She is. But many people at the early stage of their artistic life produce things which are not particularly uh, pay a bit of pricey at the time. And as they are become appreciated, they go up in price. But the money is actually collected by the galleries and the people who resell the product, not by the original producer. So deferred value creation means that you have a stake in the value that your product realizes two, three, five, ten years after you created it. And you could also recognize national differences and the stake of nations in the ownership of the product. And that means you need not just a, a national innovation system, but an international innovation system, which is focused on transfer of knowledge rather than the blocking of knowledge. You may think that this is, you know, sort of concludes some wild utopian pipe dream. It's not at all. It's actually the key method which is emerging in the new social technologies of open source and open access. For example, the Internet is jointly owned. No single person, there's no Internet ownership company, no, no Google or Microsoft. It's a shared product. The World Wide Web, it's managed by a community. Virtually all programming languages are managed. You don't, you don't pay to use a programming language. You find some other way to reward the inventors of the programming language, but not through their, not through their ownership of the product. Many operating systems are open source. Standards, engineering standards for electricity transmission, telecommunication, postal system, engineering designs. These are all owned by communities. And it, Actually, open source is now driving the dramatic changes going on in the journal industry and in book production. So, in fact, a very interesting historical point that not many people realize, the modern personal computer is an open source product. In other words, we're not just talking about uh, the mental uh, element of uh, of uh, uh, an invention which may be wholly mental in some cases or only you know material form with a mental content such as a computer in another it's a very real and vital branch of, of, of material production and in fact the modern personal computer uh, in which nobody has a patent arose from a famous case in 1967 called the abc case up until then sperry rand had had a patent on the computer you could not produce any computer without either paying Pat sperry rand money or them taking you to court and stopping you when sperry rand lost that patent because it turned out they'd actually stolen the original technology from from uh, a physicist in iowa which is a quite interesting thing uh, it didn't not the, the the case finding of the judge merely removed the patent of Sperry Rand. It didn't award it to anybody else. So nobody owned that patent. It was open source. And the result this resulted in the explosive growth of the personal computer industry, one of the most rapid and pervasive technologies of our time. So the result of open source was just very therefore very rapid diffusion and a massive expansion of production. I want to suggest that, in fact, the software industry is pioneering distributed ownership models. Uh, there are many ways it does this. I just want to focus on one, the distinction that many companies, almost all now make between open source and premium. You can buy a basic open source version of, of, of pretty well any uh, major software uh, utility that is widely used you know i don't mean sort of very specialized systems with only four or five users you can either get the open source version which means you can do it yourself you can compile it yourself produce the program and run it and modify it if you want and a premium version now the most interesting thing is what do you get for the premium version you get the most advanced features the ones that are just now being introduced and they sell the capability to use it efficiently by giving you support, by, uh, if you want, having you uh, hire people on the basis of your premium, the level of your premium service to, to assist you to implement the program, which is a very actually quite an efficient way of doing things. And you have li special licenses now, like Creative Commons license or the MIT license, which actually protect your right to have your product diffused. So when you when you get a copy of, when you get a Creative Commons license, there's a clause that says um, you can use this as you like, but you can't 
stop me selling it. You can't stop anybody else selling it. So it's it's actually the very it's, it's, it used to be called copy left as opposed to copy right. Um, it's actually the very reverse of what WIPO is trying to do. WIPO is trying to restrict the ownership and the use and the rights that anybody has in a product to one corporate person, whereas Creative Commons is trying to make sure that that can't be done. And there are also uh, licenses that facilitate back transmission of added income to the original producer's deferred value creation. So to finish, why is this important? Well, it's essentially because of the nature of cooperative labor. Now, a very important point that is not fully understood or recognized, it's, it's known, but it's not recognized in production, is that all production is collective. In order to be collective, that is to have a multiple group of people working on the same thing, um, there's a system and a principle of organization. The individual producer is a myth. Uh, penicillin wasn't invented by uh, Fleming. It was invented by a dedicated team of researchers in Oxford who worked for four years trying to find the exact mold that would be able to produce the sufficient penicillin to put into production in wartime, where it's the main driver of, it, uh, uh, of the need for penicillin. Uh, and eventually it was taken over by a uh, uh, Smith Klein Glaxo, I can't remember, the, the, the US company that became uh, the first big pharma company because they had the productive resources to do it. No single person knows how to build a railway. It's a collective knowledge. So in the industrial age, when material production dominated, cooperation was mediated by a machine. Workforce was essentially an extension of the machine. Anybody who's seen Charlie Chaplin's uh, Hard Times knows the very famous scene where the machine is controlling him. This brutalizes workers and it destroys their creativity. But knowledge production is not managed in that way. It's mediated by societies. It arises from the direct connection between multiple producers and users, which is precisely why they should jointly own it, because they jointly do it. This enhances humanity and lays the basis, as nonomy uh, requires, and rightly, for a new type of human in a new type of society. So a very uh, brief introduction. I hope that has been of some use. I'm actually going to be arguing for that, uh, the conference that I am attending, uh, after this one in Moscow, and I will continue to pursue this idea and invite anybody who wishes to join me in that uh, so to do. Thank you very much.